let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Olapade then. So uh, this is our second week of the SOURCE seminar. Thanks everybody for calling in. Um, Dr. Olapade is the Walter L. Palmer Distinguished Service Professor of Medicine and Human Genetics here at the University of Chicago. Um, she's an international expert in breast cancer and uh, has done a lot of research, which she'll talk about some of today, looking at early detection, treatment and prevention of breast cancer, as well as genetics of breast cancer. Um, so without uh, any more hubbub, I'll turn it over to Dr. Olapade. Thanks. Okay. How is everyone today? Uh, feel free to unmute your slides and then just... Uh, say something so I know you are alive and well. I have Doing this well. advice. <laughs> Doing good. Doing well. Yeah. Feeling good. Everyone say a big ha. Green. <laughs> Feeling well. Okay, very good. So did anyone um, have a chance to read the two papers I sent to you? Yep. Yep. Yes. yes. Okay, so what are some of the, your thoughts and questions that come up from reading those papers? This is a time when we can have a, a general uh, free discussion about the papers, and then I'll try to end up by then applying the uh, concept in the paper to my talk. So let's just have a general free discussion first. Who wants to go first? You want to raise your hand? Or drop me a question in the in the chat box. Hello. Uh, Dr. Alapati, there's a first question. Uh, Vivek, do you want to read your question out loud? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I know the papers cover like more actionable mutations in certain breast cancers, but kind of like. Uh, I want to talk more about like, the other side of it. So could you discuss a little bit about triple negative breast cancer and different treatment options for that? Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about triple negative breast cancer in my talk. And, and so we'll come back and address that. I'm not able to see your chart. So I'm going to have uh, Aviva be the, um, you know, gather the questions so that I will address them as we go through my talk. Okay, who else? Um, I was wondering if um, we have now integrated, because in one of the articles it said that um, the problem was integrating proteomic analysis with genomic analysis, and I'm wondering how that has evolved like from then, because that was like early 2000s, whether analysis in genomes and proteins have been well integrated to understand how cancer works? Yeah, so um, that's a great question because uh, you know the two papers I gave you really come from very different perspective. One was the brute force um, mapping and cloning and finding disease genes that we had to go through uh, in, in, in sort of in the 70s and 80s. You know, it all depends on the level of resolution and we, whatever we had was what we used, which was to uh, really focus on genomes. And then we went from genomes to, oh, well, maybe we should really be thinking about chromatin and epigenetics. And so we started, you know, thinking about how to measure um, RNA and then epigenetic changes. And because we didn't have the tools to look at proteins, uh, and as you all know from your if you haven't done molecular biology, at least you've done some basic biology needed for medicine, that everything acts through protein, right? Protein modification. Uh, uh, so just measuring things based on gene expression may not accurately capture what is actually happening at the cellular level. So that's why when you know, we've thought about cancer as a complex disorder, uh, we're only as good as the tools we have to actually answer some questions. So that's why I really wanted you to uh, dig, dig down into the uh, paper by Weinberg. Because at some point, Weinberg talked about the hallmarks of cancer as if we knew everything. 
And now in his old age, he's become very cynical because he knows that it's not just as simple as, you know, it's a transistor radio. If we just figure out the wiring of the cancer cells and then we can just turn it on and off. And so that's really a very good um, uh, paper for you to uh, begin to think about uh, where we are and where we need to get to. So yes, proteins are now, now getting in integrated, but there's still a whole host of things we have no knowledge about. And so some of the big data uh, science work, some of the um, uh, protein atlas, genome atlas work that's, uh, that's sort of been driving uh, oncology in the last few years are now going to all be redone. So that's why, you know, even though I've done genomics, I'm now really looking to think about a proteomics platform to begin to answer some un previously unanswered questions. And luckily, we have a, a new uh, 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 program in chemical biology and proteomics at the University of Chicago. The new uh, Dushuswa uh, Center uh, for Microbiome Research, uh, the, uh, the, the Molecular Engineering uh, Institute or school that have just uh, recently been added to uh, the University of Chicago, I think will allow us to begin to answer some of those fundamental mental questions in, 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 in real time. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts, any other questions that you have from the pap two papers? I just have a question about um, the culture surrounding um, the BRCA1 and 2 discovery, it was interesting to me that it seemed like everyone was really collaborative at the beginning when trying to sequence a human genome and everything like that. And then Myriad came in and uh, put a patent on the BRCA1 and 2 gene, which uh, the article said was overturned in 2013. But it just seemed like an interesting dichotomy and I was curious if you could speak to that at all. Yeah, so that's a good question and an important observation. So now we're in the age where we're talking about team science, right? But you can imagine what was going on in the 70s and 80s. Everybody was in their little lab trying to, you know, beat the other person. And uh, it was actually the, uh, so what, what year was, 90, uh, was uh, BRCA1 cloned? Uh, I think it was in the uh, uh, 1994. 1994. That was that that year. I would never forget. It was a sort of a turning point in my career, because uh, what happened was 1990. I was a postdoc. I met Mary Claire King uh, at a Cold Spring Harbor conference where Francis Collins, who is the uh, head of the NIH, uh, was present, and he was trying to map cystic fibrosis gene. And I was mapping uh, a melanoma gene on chromosome nine. And then Mary Claire King was mapping uh, chromosome 17 for BRCA1. And, uh, and I remember how she came and was presenting the fact that she had now put this contig together and had mapped the locus for BRCA1. And, uh, and of course, when she published her science paper, there were a lot of people who sort of did, didn't think she had the, the locus mapped correctly or had comments about it. So I, I, thought, I thought her talk was a little bit defensive because it was hot. She had just published it. And here was I sitting in the audience and thinking, how could she be so sure that she actually has mapped the region that everybody else was competing to map, but she got there first because she had the microsatellite markers because of her work, actually uh, trying to save orphans and help them reunite with their uh, children in, uh, in Latin America, right? She was really one of the most you know, uh, uh, amazing scientists that had cared about a global community and that had really tried to use has science to help humanity by doing, um, you know, uh, my, using microsatellite markers to, ma to, to help children, uh, you know, after the uh, Chilean dictator took them away from their parents. 
So you saw, you heard, you, you read in her article that she thought, oh, I would have no job. You know, there's this, uh, this crisis and life was coming to an end. And yet, you know, was able to now use that opportunity to, you know, transition and, and do some more work that allowed her to map uh, the BRC1 low cost. So anyway, 1990, I met her. I was a postdoc in Dr. Rowley's lab. And she basically transformed my life because she said, look, you are a clinician. I'm a uh, basic scientist. I am looking for families to uh, help us really narrow down this region. Why don't you go and, and, and I said, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm expecting to join the faculty in 1991. I want to start this cancer risk clinic because I have to distinguish myself from my mentor. You know, how can I help you? And she said, just help me find families with breast cancer. Because if we find this gene, then we can immediately replicate and do stuff. And of course, you know, uh, as I, she said, you know, do things that are really going to be to your advantage. So my advantage was I can have access to patients. So I started collecting patients in my clinic and they kept coming and coming. And women actually were at the forefront. You know, there's a little bit of advocacy, a little bit of, um, really making sure you get uh, uh, buy-in from the community to be able to, be, to stay competitive. So I started collaborating with her. And I think what she wrote in that paper was actually true because I also started, I collaborated with Myriad Genetics. I actually gave them my clone so that they could map the melanoma gene. But one of the things that I didn't know at that time was that if you're trying to compete with industry, they're gonna squash you. So they uh, scooped her, published BRCA, uh, actually it was me, they, they scooped me first. So instead of us being able to publish our P16 and the uh, CDKN2 uh, melanoma, uh, familiar melanoma locals, uh, Myriad published it, they had a science paper, I wasn't included in it because I, I thought I could compete with them. It was the saddest day of my life when I got scooped. However, Six months later, they scooped Mary Claire King and they published on BRCA1. And that was when I then said, oh, well, there's life after this. If they can scoop Mary Claire King, who was I uh, to not get scooped? And so we began a collaboration and I started really emphasizing the translational aspect of my work. And that's what's really brought me to the point where I am now, where I can talk about genomics and clinical cancer care. Because I realized that if I could play to my strength, which is I'm a physician. I understand the questions and I can advance this field by really asking questions that come from the clinic. Then I had still a career as a physician scientist. So um, let's hold on to some of your questions and then let me get through what I just told you and then we'll come back uh, at the end. Is that okay? All right. Okay, so that's my historical uh, perspective because um, as I just uh, uh, told you about, I was a fellow with uh, Dr. Gollum, who was my program director. And she said, well, go map genes with Dr. Rowley. And Dr. Rowley at that point, uh, really the level of um, resolution that we had in, when I was a fellow was at the level of chromosomes where she could do karyotypes. And uh, Dr. Riley is the most famous Prisca uh, uh, alum who really transformed cancer care. Because at the time she was really talking about chromosomes in cancer, everyone thought it was an epiphenomenon, that it was not really uh, true that genes had anything to do with cancer. And so there was a real uh, a debate about whether there was a genetic basis for cancer. And I think as she began to show that, they, um, that you know, there were specific chromosome rearrangements that were driving specific cancers. Uh, when she um, described the chromosome 922 uh, translocation uh, in CML, and then she developed lots of recurring uh, uh, chromosomal ab aberrations that were unique to specific cancers. I think the world really began to accept that it, for real. This is... Um, uh, uh, these uh, uh, genes were important in cancer. Another really wonderful man that influenced my life was uh, uh, Henry Lynch of the famous Lynch syndrome. 
So at the time that I was coming out of the lab, Dr. Gollum said, you know, there's this uh, old oncologist who used to come to uh, uh, meetings and he would bring all these pedigrees. No one ever went to his poster because everybody was looking for, you know, drugs to, 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 to cure cancer. So if you really want to start your own cancer risk clinic, maybe you should go to him in Omaha. Uh, he died um, last year. But Henry Lynch sort of collected consecutive cases of patients who came to his clinic, and then he described the families and how they presented. And all of us uh, in this picture, of course, we're now, uh, this is Ken Offit at Memorial, um, Judy Gava at uh, Dana Farber, Steve Nerod uh, in Toronto, and, uh, and Jeff Whitesell. We were all coming out of labs and miserable, not knowing what we were going to be able to do as physician scientists. So we all said, okay, maybe we can, uh, you know, figure out a way to translate genetics in the clinic. And so we had a workshop and Henry was with us and we all thought, okay, we'll never win the Nobel Prize, but maybe we can make an impact in people's lives. So that's really how, um, uh, if you actually look at how we came to begin to understand cancer as a genetic disease, uh, Broca, and that's really the, the name of a French physician who first described familial breast cancer and, you know, published it, astute physician, and saw clustering of cancer. And then uh, first uh, pedigree of a Lynch syndrome family published in 1895. And then uh, it's actually uh, last year was 50 years when Dr. Lee, another oncologist, and Dr. Fremeni, an epidemiologist started describing families with soft tissue sarcomas, leukemia, and lymphoma, and then um, identified that these were families uh, that we now call Lee from Ellis syndrome, and that they, and now that we can do genetic testing, the P53 is the gene that is mutated in Lee from any families. But it took us all of that. And then late in the uh, uh, 90s, uh, we started uh, really being able to map uh, chromosomes uh, to specific uh, uh, sort of uh, diseases to spe specific chromosomes. So that's the germline with APC to chromosome 5. I told you 1990, medical King, BRCA1. And then uh, what was really nice in the 90s was that we also had yeast geneticists, bacterial geneticists, who were also mapping. And in fact, you know, uh, um, mouse geneticists who were also mapping different traits in uh, mouse species and in animal models. And by mapping these uh, traits, there was a trait that caused microsatellite instability. And that trait was because we were all using microsatellite markers to find disease locus. And that's how they were able to show a connection between families that were segregating colorectal cancer, the Lynch syndrome, and this uh, um, phenomenon of microsatellite instability in yeast, and then doing comparative genetics of, of yeast genetics and human genetics found MSH2 uh, as a gene that was uh, uh, mutated in Lynch syndrome. So that's sort of what happened. And then, you know, because I was in the lab and, I, you know, I really wanted to get going on um, translating this in the clinic, we started the ASCO Cancer Genetics Education Task Force, where we really made it a, 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 a purview of oncologists to know about family history and to make sure that everyone in oncology had a chance to know their, uh, their risk for cancer. And, uh, and then, of course, now, uh, we're talking about targeted therapies for inherited cancers. And all of this has happened within the time that I, I started my career, just like you, working uh, with my mentor in the lab and then thinking about how to actually make a difference. So I'm not going to belabor the point, but we know that germline mutations occur. That is, it's in the egg and it's in the sperm. And one of the things that you will find uh, when, that I found when we started the ASCO Cancer Genetics Education was how ignorant most physicians are in terms of genetics, because it wasn't really taught in medical schools in those days. And when people knew genetics, it was related to, you know, children with disability and most, most uh, clinicians didn't even pay attention to genetics. 
And so they always had the confusion that, you know, if you are asking somebody if they have a family history of breast cancer, they would only ask about the mother, not paying attention to the fact that a gene that is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner, you can inherit the gene both on, on your father's side or your mother's side. And so we had to tell people how to actually take a three generation uh, family uh, uh, history because you may not find it on your, uh, any family history of cancer and yet you could have inherited, uh, inherited susceptibility. And then for somatic mutations, which is sort of what uh, the Weinberg paper was coming about, yes, you know, it can arise by chance in any cell of the body and you can't pass it down. And so for a long time, we, we focused on somatic mutations because we were looking for chromosome abnormalities in cancer. And it wasn't really until people like us came into the field of oncology to actually say, you know what, your germline genetics actually propels you and determines what kind of somatic changes you have that people started thinking about integrating germline and somatic genetics in the clinic. So uh, just to uh, talk about the fundamental challenges that we have is that if we focus on genes, then we actually focus, uh, we forget that in fact, you, you know, your DNA isn't your destiny. Even if you were born with inherited susceptibility, it's just a probability. And if you uh, follow Mary Claire King's uh, uh, career, uh, we, we have a lot of statistical geneticists who are going to be able to model different things. And we have uh, a whole new area of uh, epidemiology where we're talking about genetic epidemiology. And in this COVID era, I'm sure you have heard so many things about, you know, projections, you know, when are we going to reach our peak? When are this? Because statisticians and epidemiologists can always model things. So I liked uh, this, um, this paper uh, that was uh, the causes of cancer quantitative estimates of avoidable risk of cancer in the United States today. So if you talk to uh, anyone who is really very focused on epidemiology uh, and which really hindered us, they always said, well, you know, even if there's a genetic component of cancer, well, you know, monozygotic teens, dizygotic teens, we can estimate what proportion of their familiar risk can be explained by their shared genes and what proportion is actually due to lifestyle. Uh, you can look at it in this way and say, well, that means that, you know, um, uh, there's very uh, uh, low, there's very little that genes contribute to cancer. Or you can look at it and say, okay, even if you have a genetic mutation, you can still modify the outcome because you can, through lifestyle changes, modify the expression of the genes. And that's why uh, you know, those of us who are really in the, in the field wanting to understand the genetic basis of inherited cancers really feel that, yes, your gene doesn't uh, determine your destiny. And therein lies the hope that we can actually do a lot of prevention. Um, do you want me to, to pause and, and take questions if you have questions or are you still good? Just yeah. explaining um, how to interpret this graph one more time. Yeah, okay. So, so what they were doing is that, uh, so monozygotic twins, what does that mean? Identical. Identical, and then dizygotic. So what they're trying to do is, uh, what is the cumulative risk of cancer, uh, of, of having the same type of cancer in, uh, in twin studies? So epidemiologists would have had and there's so many cohorts where they have recruited twins, monozygotic, dizygotic twins, and then this cohort, they followed all for a very long time over their lifespan. And so, the, of course, they're looking at what is the concordance uh, between, in, in terms of the in, uh, cumulative incidence of cancer uh, overall in the twins, and then whether the twins are monozygotic or dizygotic. And so this is really just trying to say, um, that uh, in, a, in a twin cohort, um, because they share their genes, their risk of cancer, their cumulative risk will be much more similar if they're monozygotic, dizygotic, and it will be different if you just look at everybody in the population.
okay? And then uh, in this, uh, uh, and this particular uh, uh, paper by, uh, uh, um, by Pito was just saying that, okay, if we look at uh, uh, regions of the world or, or cohorts where you have a high incidence of cancer or low incidence regions, and then you look at their lifestyle, then he was making the argument that the lifestyle of women in the United States or people in the United States who smoke, who are obese, who have other lifestyle risk factors, especially tobacco, cigarette, that you could uh, explain that most of the cancer was actually caused by environmental exposure and environmental agents. So that's really trying to um, match the epidemiology of cancer in general, in the general population, and then epidemiology of cancer in dizygotic or monozygotic thing. So what they are talking about here is that uh, for breast cancer, the, the uh, uh, concordance uh, in terms of the cumulative risk or familiar risk is only about 28% that you can explain due to the shared genes, uh, whereas uh, for dizygotic it's actually uh, about 19% in terms of breast cancer risk, okay? Thank you. So that's saying that, uh, and it's in the same way saying that, you know, there's still a lot of things that are unexplained in terms of a genetic basis for cancer, right? If you have dizygotic things, you have monozygotic things, and only 28% of their shared genes contribute to cancer, then that means that there's still a lot of things that we don't know about cancer. And so what, how, but how do genes interact with the environment? Those are things that we now have to think about. However, because we have these uh, cases in families where you know for sure, uh, when you have bilateral breast cancer at 34 and 40, and then this patient of mine, when I first met her, this is an African, my first African-American patient after I started collaborating with Mary Claire King and we published that, you know, BRCA1 is actually really real. This woman walked into my clinic having had breast cancer at 24, survived it at 35. And I actually met her when she was about uh, 39 years old. And we recruited her onto our study. We tested her and lo and behold, she had a BRCA mutation and her mother had died of bilateral breast cancer. And I told her, you, you have a very high risk for ovarian cancer. Uh, why don't we just go in and you know, take out your ovaries? Uh, but she said, come on, I've had cancer twice. I'm only, you know, uh, uh, maybe I might still be able to have another child and I don't want to take my ovaries out. So when you talk about bad outcomes, sometimes we can actually predict that you're going to have a cancer risk, but if we cannot change your behavior or have an intervention that you will accept, then that genetic testing didn't really help my patient. So she had ovarian cancer at uh, uh, 41 and she died by the time she was 43. And it was a very painful experience to have me go through this with her because I knew that she had a BRCA1 mutation. I knew she needed to have her ovaries out, but I could not compel her to go and have her ovaries out because it's still a decision that a patient has to make. So then I started really thinking about uh, what uses this uh, knowledge because if you, are, if you are born with an inherited BRCA1 mutation, you, you often get early onset breast cancer. And then if you come in and you have breast cancer, this is your risk of a second primary breast cancer. It's not, you know, it's about 5% per year versus 1% per year of, for patients with sporadic breast cancer. And then if you survive, you also have a risk of ovarian or fallopian tube. So at what point should we intervene? Is it before you ever get your first cancer or is it after you have had your, your, your first breast cancer? So that's the debate in the field. A lot of oncologists are testing and most of what we have now is actually when people show up in oncology clinics already with cancer. And I've been making the argument with Mary Claire King that no, we need to do it before anyone ever gets cancer. And we can debate that back and forth. But this is what I've learned is that we got BRCA1 in 1994, 
and then by 1995 we had BRCA2. And the way we were able to find BRCA2 was to exclude all of the families with ovarian cancer and then look at the families with male breast cancer because it turns out that BRCA2 actually can uh, is more penetrant for uh, in men with a mutation. And so if you have a family with male breast cancer, you're more likely to find to have BRCA2. And that was really important. Whenever you have genetic heterogeneity and you have phenotype heterogeneity, if you're really trying to map a gene, you have to be very precise. So within a year of finding that there were so many families that did not have BRCA1, we then refined how to find BRCA2 and then uh, medical, uh, the, uh, the uh, Myriad also uh, and the uh, University of Utah sub, uh, uh, group uh, identified uh, BRCA2. And that's how uh, Myriad really had patent for both BRCA1 and BRCA2 until the Supreme Court um, overturned it. So now that uh, uh, since that, uh, uh, 2011, when the Supreme Court, 2013, when they overturned um, the uh, ruling, we now, everybody is getting genetic testing. The testing, the cost of testing is considerably cheaper than ever before. And as a result of that, especially with uh, testing tumors, we're now finding that BRCA uh, mutations are in pancreatic cancer, melanoma, gastric, colon, laryngeal, hematology. In fact, any cancer you, you, you test, you'll see these uh, mutations coming up. But because I know the history of how we got here, I actually think that some of those um, uh, mutations that are popping up in other cancers, they're part of uh, the uh, syndrome and we just had not uh, really carefully tested everyone because we, when we started the work, we needed to find a very heterogeneous group to do the testing in. Um, the first thing that we, we found after Medical King and, uh, and Myriad and the mutations were found was that we then started finding that some people who were not related, they had the same exact mutation. And if they had the same exact mutation, it's either it's because it's a, it's, a, it's a mutation with a founder effect. So whenever you have a population that shrinks and then rapidly expands by intermarrying within itself, either because they are marooned on an island or as in the case of the Ashkenazi Jews, the uh, Jews of uh, Eastern European ancestry, then you can have a uh, Holocaust and history of persecution make uh, a mutation rapidly expand. So some of the mutations that have been identified and Ashkenazi Jews are Jews of Eastern European ancestry, most of whom came to the uh, US. But uh, we also know that Sephardic Jews, that some of these genes actually, uh, um, this mutation uh, got fixed in the Jewish population before Christ. And so as a result of that, uh, these mutations are quite common across the Jewish diaspora, and it's not limited to uh, Jews that came through Spain or Jews that um, were in um, uh, uh, through you, uh, through uh, Eastern Europe. Um, so I just made a list of all this uh, different population. Mexican, for example, we see this 185 del AG uh, mutation in Mexicans, and it turns out that there are a lot of um, Christo Jews who. Uh, converted to Catholicism, and they, uh, you know, migrated to Latin America, or they come from Mexico, and um, and they are in America with, you know, uh, uh, mutations. And I've seen some of them in my clinic. And initially, I was thinking, you know, you're Mexican. What is why are you uh, coming in with an uh, Ashkenazi Jewish mutation? And it turned out when I actually asked my patient, she said, well, you know, in the part of uh, uh, in Laredo, where I come from in, um, in Mexico, which is really right at the border with uh, Texas, we have the menorah and we have the cross. So I think these are, um, you know, Jews who converted to Catholicism. Uh, and then, of course, in Chicago, I highlight Polish because, uh, you know, we, many of us uh, uh, know that uh, outside of uh, Poland, Chicago has probably 
the uh, largest concentration of Polish uh, families, uh, Ukrainian uh, families, and they all have what I call a uh, Balkan mutation, where the mutation, they're not Jews, they don't self-report as Jewish, but they have the same founder mutation that's being reported among Jews. So I put this in there that any country, Pakistanis, depending on French Canadians, there's a really uh, two very important uh, founder mutations that are present in French Canadians. And you can use that uh, to actually do population uh, level uh, testing and screening because it's very, uh, uh, it would be much cheaper than sequencing all of BRC1 and 2. So let me go on quickly to say that uh, the field is expanded. We've had BRC1 and 2. These are the high penetrant genes. Uh, this uh, uh, slide just shows you what we, what we think is the proportion of uh, breast cancer that may be due to BRC1 or 2, other genetic familial uh, genes, or that may be sporadic, just bad luck. And uh, this piece of the pie, we keep working on it because we're actually not sure we, until we are able to have better tools to actually understand. We don't know whether everybody has something or the other that predisposes them to cancer. So we talk about uh, minor uh, allele frequencies uh, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is really doing genome-wide association. Uh, we talk about intermediate risk genes, ATM, check 2 All these genes were identified uh, as genes that are involved in DNA repair pathways because we seem to think that there's something about DNA damage that really propels you to developing cancer. And so, then you have your very high risk genes over here. But I put this in here just to tell you that this uh, genetics uh, is, is prime time because we can now put a lot of uh, uh, variants into a polygenic risk score. And polygenic risk scores are being uh, put and used in cardiology, they're used in diabetes, they're used in neuro, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, they're used now in psychiatry to begin to look at risk and susceptibility. And they also provide us a way to actually develop new drugs uh, to be able to uh, really accelerate precision medicine. So this is available for breast cancer. Uh, we talk about uh, polygenic risk score for prediction of, um, of breast cancer uh, uh, subtypes. Uh, we have the risk uh, now that we can also do it for prostate cancer, for colorectal cancer, because we have over the years have looked at studies, either cohort studies or case control studies that allow us to be able to develop, um, you know, if you, if you have genome-wide association study and you look at 94,000 cases compared to 75,000 controls, well, you can begin to look at, you know, what are some of the things that are outliers uh, for people who are at the highest risk and, and then figure out what to do. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been following uh, PRS or polygenic risk stories. Uh, raise your hands if you're familiar with uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, you can vote. Raise your hands. You know how to raise your hands. If you have ever heard of genome-wide association studies. Everyone can use the little blue raise hand feature in the yeah. chat area just to make it easy for Dr. Olapati to see who is aware and who's not aware. Can you see them raising their hand? Or yeah, I can see them. I can see them raising okay. their hand. Okay. Okay. So a number of you do know, and some many of you don't know. So uh, that's not um, un unusual. But the important thing is, you know, we've been able to really use that to begin to think about uh, risk stratification. Okay. So let's keep going. Uh, so now that we have the genes, we can do genomic testing for unaffected individuals. You can tailor screening, risk reduction, surgical, chemo prevention. And then if they're affected nowadays, what 
my colleagues are doing mostly is to think about targeted treatment options or, or for women who are newly diagnosed, whether they want to have, uh, you know, surgery, bilateral prophylactic surgery and risk reducing surgery. Uh, but what I'm really, really, really keen on is that I would like to be able to see if we can uh, really uh, look at uh, diagnosing cancer at an earlier stage when it's easier to treat and potentially curable. And, uh, you know, risk is not distributed e equally across uh, the continuum. We can really find the high risk population. So in a screening strategy, you could decide to screen the whole population or you could think about doing, uh, uh, using, um, uh, really finding the highest risk population. So let me show you an example of this woman with aggressive, I know somebody asked about triple negative breast cancer. This white woman went in every two years to go and have a mammogram. By the time she developed breast cancer, look at this. And uh, in the, after her screening mammogram, by the time I saw her, within two weeks of getting the, the biopsy, the time it took us to actually do everything, she was, uh, it was already, it had doubled in size. And this woman was dead within a year of being diagnosed with aggressive triple negative breast cancer. And she did everything we asked her to do. She went to get mammograms and we said, oh, you know, you can do a screening every two years. Okay, this woman um, in the US, she's 45 years old. She has small breasts, very dense breasts because she's still premenopausal. And, you know, she, because she, you know, was really worried about her risk, you know, or is one of those that's very compliant, went to get mammograms every year. And she had a perfectly normal mammogram six months ago. But because she had very small breasts, she felt a lump. And then she was able to get access to me. And within six months of finding the lump, she had a biopsy. It was triple negative breast cancer. And you can see the cancer was not detected even on the mammogram that she got the same day that we got this ultrasound and we got her MRI. And you can see the cancer was already 2.1 centimeter within six months of having, in, in, at that time, a normal mammogram. And even at the time of, mammo, of diagnosis, this mammogram did not show this cancer that was already 2.1 centimeter. And the only thing that saved her was that she was small breasted and she could feel a lump. So we find a lot of young women who are diagnosed with breast cancer feel their own lump. And when they go to the doctor, what's most like, likely to happen is somebody, oh, you're too young to have breast cancer. Oh, well, you know, maybe it's just uh, an adenoma. And so young women, 30% of them, they have the, mist, the cancer missed. And that's why there's now a law that if you get a woman and the mammogram shows increased density, you must get uh, supplemental screening, either with an ultrasound or with an MRI, because we miss 30% of breast cancer, even when it's there in women with dense breast. And uh, mammographic density is also a risk factor for breast cancer. So I'm showing this to you because here's where I want to get to. So this woman uh, was 61 years old, uh, but at 41, she had had a breast cancer. She survived it because she had um, um, a, a good chemotherapy that really cured her of the first breast cancer. And it wasn't until she was tested and she was found to have a BRCA1 mutation that we then started putting her on a, a screening protocol and uh, we started doing MRI every six months. And we were able to actually find this cancer eight millimeter uh, of uh, uh, breast cancer with four millimeter invasive component. Her sentinel lymph node biopsy was negative. She was ER positive, PR positive. She didn't need chemo and that was the end of it, right? So that's how we can actually do cancer interception by integrating precision screening with genetics. So that's one of the things that I'm looking for is that if we really uh, have a high risk strategy, we can move the needle whereby we can uh, sp stop spending money uh, by screening everybody in the, in the whole population. And then we can save money by really uh, uh, as, uh, uh, making sure that we can have high risk screening for women who are at the highest risk. Okay, 
So now let's talk a little bit about racial disparity and uh, uh, population screening. So here is what we have spent a lot of our money doing, finding hormone receptor positive for two negative breast cancer in older white women and over-diagnosing DCIS, which may, many of them may die from without ever having invasive cancer. Here, here is black women. Here is the reason why we have such huge racial disparities. Black women are more likely to get breast cancer in their 20s, 30s, and more likely to get triple negative breast cancer. Other uh, um, non-Hispanic whites and uh, uh, specific, uh, Pacific Islanders, you can see that uh, triple negative breast cancer is really the biggest one that we're trying to find. And um, interestingly, BRC1 mutation carriers are more likely to get triple negative breast cancer. That's why it becomes even more important for us to do screening. So we've been doing some work across the diaspora and asking is the burden of lethal breast cancer due to genetic differences? And could we study, uh, you know, of course, this is the slave route where Africans from West Africa came to the US, Africans from East Africa uh, are, are, are coming to uh, Latin America or going to India. And so we've seen a lot of um, uh, uh, really migration uh, and the whole idea around out of Africa theory of early migration is that we all came out of Africa and then we came into the uh, uh, new world and we have selection for many different reasons. But then uh, as a result of 400 years of slavery and social injustice, we have people of African ancestry who in so many parts of the world who continue to have uh, 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 poor access to care. So the first question we wanted to ask was to see whether who is getting uh, uh, triple negative breast cancer. So uh, uh, Dr. Huo is a, is a cancer epidemiologist with us and has, was actually a postdoc when he did this work. We went to Nigeria, several places, Senegal, Barbados. Uh, we looked at, we compared to whites in the US and then whites in, uh, in the North Carolina uh, study group. And what we found is that, yes, the incidence of breast cancer is highest because we screen in, the, in, in Europe and in Australia where there are a lot of white women. Uh, uh, but the death is actually in places in the world where we're not doing uh, a lot of screening. And then I was uh, really uh, fascinated by the fact that Nigeria had one of the highest mortality uh, uh, um, uh, um, to incidence ratio in the world. So we were looking at what is the type of breast cancer that these places were having. And this is your garden variety ER positive breast cancer that grows slowly. This is your triple negative breast cancer and HER2 positive breast cancer. And these are your undifferentiated. And we still see that it's probably undifferentiated because the genomic studies that we're using to classify people actually is not capturing the, the disease and the, the, uh, the genes that are actually driving uh, the tumor in this in, uh, individual. So that's really why we have been focused on trying to understand the genetic basis of breast cancer across the African diaspora. But um, whether you look at the Indian subcontinent or you look uh, in other admixed populations, there's a lot of work to be done uh, to understand breast cancer. So let's go back to BRC1 and 2. And um, this is my, my new, Angel I used to have Angelina Jolie on this page, but now I have Beyonce's dad because Beyonce's dad developed male breast cancer this year. And then it sort of really made it public that he's a BRC2 mutation carrier. It's my first, you know, uh, uh, real uh, non-European ancestry person who came out to the US to say, I have a BRCA mutation. And so, but we've been doing this work now. After that uh, Myriad uh, patent was overturned, we've done, we know there's direct to consumer marketing. We've done work in Nigeria, Brazil, Cameroon, Uganda, in collaboration with Mary Kay Pink. And the only way we are able to do this work is either with philanthropy, uh, uh, grant funding, but whenever you talk to uh, you know, donors or you even talk to doctors about the fact that why have we had genetic testing and it's not 
permeated to the non-European ancestry group. It's because when the studies were first published, the only papers were coming out from Israel, uh, from Ashkenazi Jewish populations where they have been very familiar and they've been early adopters of genetics. And now we're now trying to roll it into other populations where the genetic influence is actually likely to be much more because they don't have the later onset uh, ER positive breast cancer. So uh, we did the study, we looked at cases and controls in Nigeria, and you can look at the proportion that had BRCA1 and BRCA2 when we look at our cases. That's a long bar. Lots of 15% of these uh, unselected patients that we tested in Nigeria had BRCA1 and 2, and then these are the other genes that were in the panel. And that got us really thinking that, um, uh, you know, the reason why it took so long is because each one had their own personal mutation. There was not the three common mutations that was really cheap and easy to do in a founder mutation like a, a mutation where you can say I'm Ashkenazi Jewish and for $300 you can test them. Each test you have to find their own personal mutation. And then we found out that in fact if you use family history, we would have missed all of the patients who turned out to be positive. In the, uh, in the cohort because most people had no family history or maybe they didn't document family history and the proportion, the larger proportion of the pie who tested positive were actually in this no family history and uh, whether they were older than 50 or younger than 50, very enriched uh, in early onset breast cancer, of course. And if you have a family history, yes, of course, we'll find the mutation, but majority did not have a mutation. So what does that mean if you, don't, you find them and they don't have a mutation? Does that talk about the penetrance? Uh, so we know that risks uh, to mutation actually varies by birth year and, uh, and lots of studies that we have done in the last two or three decades to see how uh, BRCA mutation can be, uh, uh, can be uh, influenced by other lifestyle uh, uh, factors. So what are the unanswered questions? Well, the population differences in prevalence of BRCA mutations, yes, it's been well documented among Jewish women, but other population remain understudied. Uh, DNA repair pathway important in all populations. Uh, and then what is the burden of inherited mutation in the general population of cancer patients? Now we know that it's more than we previously suspected. And then does it explain disparities in health outcomes? Uh, I would say in part, because we have paucity of data in non-European ancestry groups. Uh, but what do we do as a public policy? We ask everybody to go and get a mammogram when you get to 50 or 40, or in the US, we sort of argue, or we say, okay, let's, let's average, and, and we say, oh, well, maybe you can start at 45. Uh, lots of data suggesting that if you, if you don't do personalized or, or move the needle, you're going to under, under, under screen women who are at risk for aggressive hormone receptor negative breast cancer. Uh, the same thing with prostate cancer. We've been debating about, should you get your PSA? Should you get screened? And some of the reasons why we've had this really contamination, I call it, is that one size doesn't fit all. We have to be a little bit more precise with screening. So when you screen and you find indolent DCIS, you overspend money uh, in the population doing unnecessary biopsies. So we've really been working with the USA Preventive Task Force. And now the Preventive Task Force actually asks that you test every um, Ashkenazi Jewish in your practice for BRC1 and 2 because the frequency of that mutation is one in three. And there's debate about how about other populations. I put this in here for prevalence of prostate cancer in screened populations. Look at US, if you screen populations, uh, white men 50 years or older, it's 1.6. African Americans 40 to 47 or 40, uh, 79. Or Ghanaian men with PSA just a little over uh, four and abnormal diary. Look at uh, the yield for uh, uh, detecting prostate cancer. So we need to begin to really think about how we modify our screening because one size doesn't fit all. So um, MRI is expensive. Who needs to get MRI? 
but we're studying this in our catchment area and really looking for a way to uh, accelerate progress because we can actually do better if we can uh, do breast and prostate cancer screening in an underserved population at high risk. This is just showing that we were able to show that with MRI, we can get uh, 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 triple negative breast cancer picked up early. Okay, we've just launched a national study uh, to compare uh, whether we can uh, use uh, population risk stratification to downstage breast cancer. I can talk to you more about that. We can now, uh, with genetic testing, give everybody their PRS score. And, uh, and my colleague and I are really looking to uh, start a, a fast MRI screening protocol. So let me end by uh, quickly talking about uh, the second paper, which is about germline mutations of BRCA1 and how by doing um, a genetic testing, you can see this patient who got platinum did better than controls, just based on the fact that they were BRCA1 mutation carrier. Now, uh, we're looking at cancer uh, is a disease of the genome. You have possible germline risk allele, and then you are, we're looking for immune evasion, uh, the driver and passenger mutations, treatment one, treatment two, really thinking about how we do genomics across uh, the continuum. And so, you know, whether you smoke, whether you have defect in DNA repair, these are all things that we can actually begin to look at from the germline. And uh, so these drivers, they can be genetic. And now we know that some of these drivers are coding or non-coding. And some of them may actually be impinging on molecular subtype of breast cancer, immune response. So these things are really going to be incorporated into our treatment. There's one uh, 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 randomization of beliporib and carboplatin in, in breast cancer. And what we wanted to do was to see whether we would get a signature that would tell us who's going to respond to uh, PAP inhibitor. And that was published in the New England Journal because we got the signature and we were able to uh, uh, randomized patient to uh, a PAP inhibitor. Here's uh, DNA mutations are common in metastatic prostate cancer. And because we're now doing all of this testing when the cancer is already metastasized, FDA is granting accelerated breakthrough approval for these drugs. But if you get approval for a drug that is uh, also telling you that you have an increased risk, this is really where we were before, where we use anatomy, and I, I know you guys spent so much time on your anatomy uh, 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 class. But now I'm hoping that we can just for, forgo all of that anatomy and do liquid biopsies and then be able to target what is wrong with the tumor uh, based on these uh, targeted therapies. And so the targeted therapies were really exciting and we thought we could just do one target until we started really looking at, this is a guy with, um, BRAF mutation, we targeted BRAF, the tumor disappeared only to rapidly uh, uh, recall within a short period of time. So obviously when it's already metastatic, it's too late. And so I would really say, you know, 15 weeks making the, the, the tumor go is not good enough. We have to do better. And so this is really just talking about how we look at uh, uh, response rate and my colleague will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in terms of the targeted therapy. So from stratification to precision, we're talking about clinical disease subtypes, and now we're really thinking about precision, and there's a lot more work to do. And of course, we have to integrate proteins into it. So my idea for cancer interception, uh, for those of you, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn actually won uh, the Nobel Prize, and she's really uh, you know, looked at telomerase and uh, 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 Claude Church Jane, one of the, uh, my colleagues uh, of, uh, who was able to really going from uh, cloning to telomerase to now thinking about if we know that cancer is a disease of old age and that there's, it is associated with telomere shortening, can we begin to intercept cancer by using uh, uh, what we now know uh, in terms of who's at risk and when are they at risk? So, um, you know, some of you have spat into tubes, uh, 23 and me, and a lot of our patients are spitting into lots of things and they will come to you uh, with uh, info asking you about whether they should get tested. 
in oncology, we're doing streamlined point of care counseling because what we really want to go is from uh, prevention to interception and to uh, treatment and survivorship. And I hope by the time you guys are practicing and you come to oncology, that we would have made real progress in prevention and cancer interception. So let me end by saying uh, cutting edge research is what I'm hoping you guys are gonna really be, uh, 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 be excited about. Uh, there's a whole host of big data science that's really allowing us to develop clinical trials more efficiently and, uh, and we need to really uh, improve how we use genomics for prevention, early detection and treatment. So um, that's it. Let me pause. I know that I, my hour is gone, but we started a little late and um, maybe I can take some questions before I have to wrap up. Sure, if people want to type in questions. I, I think there was one question. I don't think this was addressed. Sorry to step away for a minute, um, but uh, Maggie Lou asked, can you talk a little more on how uh, GOS is being used to uh, stratify risk and generate risk scores. Yeah, so the, the GWAS is, uh, it's, uh, so after, once we finished mapping um, every gene and, uh, and uh, you know, I told you about, and the paper that Mary Claire King gave you was really about how tedious it was to go and find one gene at a time. So in 1995, shortly after BRC1 was cloned, uh, the scientific community actually went to Congress and we asked for $5 billion. And they actually gave us $5 billion to map the human genome. And the idea was that if we can just map every gene, every single nucleotide polymorphism, then all of the experiments we want to do, we can just do it on a computer. And so that's why the 90s were an and uh, 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 early part of uh, 2005, uh, really uh, uh, 2000s allowed us to have a roadmap and we had an international hap map. We collected data from everywhere in the world and then we mapped all the different uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms and all of that. We sequenced the first genome. It was, you know, uh, 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 Crick's genome. And then since then, we've been doing a lot of genome annotation. And now you can actually look at single nucleotide polymorphisms and you can look at many, many different areas. We're all 99.9% .9 identical, but we're 0.1% different. And that 0.1% difference is what marks us as human beings. So that's why you can actually use uh, what I would call in the genome-wide association studies. There's some SNPs that are very common in the population. 50% of the po population, you have the same allele. But then there's some that have minor allele frequency of what, less than 0.1. And if it's a minor allele, and that minor allele actually can mark a disease, even though it's not very common in the general population, it may actually be able to pinpoint uh, disease traits. And so that's why we've been looking at um, genome-wide uh, association studies where we can use a, a, an array and interrogate the genome of everyone, and then look at between cases and controls, uh, do we have um, um, uh, SNPs that are common and may actually be used to map disease genes? So that's how genome-wide association studies became um, part of our armamentarium. So this is so you can add all these SNPs together. So for breast cancer, we have 313 uh, and, uh, and variants that were used in this in this paper and it was able to discriminate between people who have uh, cancer risk. And so at the um, highest quartile, we can see how that is aggregated. A simple way to explain it is if you look at uh, basketballers who are seven foot five inches or grow to be six foot 10 inches, they may have average age parents. It turns out that they just won the lottery. They just had a bunch of things that determine uh, height and they won all of those SNPs sort of, you know, in, uh, in, uh, they are the extreme of the population. So that's how we're using polygenic risk scores for predicting height, for predicting so many different complex phenotypes. Um, maybe one other question. I know Dr. Hans uh, on the line, probably ready to go, but uh, another question from 
Tom, cliche is, uh, I know there's some controversy around use of routine mammograms. Do you think they should still be recommended for all women over 50? Yeah, so the question, the controversies are now mammogram is actually because of what I call this breast cancer risk score. So we just talked about how risk is not distributed evenly. So how can you tell every woman, once you turn to 50, go and get your mammogram? It's too imprecise because not every 50 year old is going to have the same risk, right? And because 30% of women, even when they get a mammogram, the, it still misses uh, their breast cancer. So that's why it's been controversial whether mammogram actually saves life. Of course it saves life. It has re allowed a lot of women to have their cancers diagnosed early, but it has also exposed that it was an imperfect uh, tool. And so that's why we're now asking at the time you get your first mammogram, what the um, wisdom study is trying to say, if you're 40, can we randomize you to a study, agree to randomization, choose self-assignment? Uh, uh, you can look at risk-based screening, routine annual mammography, or you can be randomized to routine annual mammography or risk-based screening, where we actually do, do genetic testing and we use SNPs to randomize you to either not get uh, screening because you have, you're on the low risk in the, in the population, and you're not at risk for breast cancer so that we don't overuse a test that is imperfect. And so this study, we're hoping that it will give us a little bit more way to personalize risk because this person that in the next uh, five years, this is the general population risk, but using the uh, polygenic risk score and combining uh, other uh, lifetime history, if I tell you this is where your risk is, you might say, oh, maybe I should do something different that if I tell you, well, your risk is here, you only have you know, less than 10% chance. So that's what we're trying to do with the wisdom study. Uh, women informed uh, to screen based on measures of risk. And so wisdom, we want to get wisdom from 100,000 women who will agree to help us uh, starting at 40. Of course, the women who uh, I'm saying they should actually go and get genetic testing starting at 30 so that we can know who's going to get BRCA1 associated breast cancer. So that's sort of where we're going to get to in the future. As long as we know that as physicians, we can actually help those patients. And the reason why I'm optimistic is that uh, we are now going to be able to do MRI at you know, a, a tenth of the cost of what it used to cost us because the technology has gotten better. And if I can get women to get MRI without exposing them to radiation, and they can even just come in every six months and get their cancer screened, then I'm removing a lot of the barriers and a lot of the controversies in the field. All right, uh, one, one more question. Last question, then we'll take a, a like three or four minute break while we get Dr. Hans slides up. Um, but this is from Joe Krongold. He said, um, Joe, you can wave at everybody. He said, uh, my understanding is that these risk scores are conditional on the environment and on treatment options if we're talking about mortality risk. Can you comment on what blind spots this leads to, and maybe in particular how this might lead to disparities? Yeah, so that's a very good question, because the risk scores uh, and what we're actually trying to do with the risk score is, I, mean, I just told you that most of the data is coming from rich white women in the um, in, uh, in the uh, industrialized world, right? So what we're now doing is we're actually really, th okay, what about the Japanese women? They have a lower risk for breast cancer, but they also have very dense breasts. What should they do in Japan? What should they do in India? How do you customize it to the diverse populations that we treat in America? So this is why if, if you have a risk of ER positive breast cancer and the PRS score is being programmed, uh, this is coded bias, right? Because you're going to get a score that works for somebody who is white and lives in Eastern Europe or, uh, or in uh, Northern Europe. But you're not going to get it right for women of African ancestry or other populations who do not have the same gene and environment um, uh, exposure. So that's why we are saying that, yes, the tool is out there. It's imprecise. And for the, con for the companies that are actually trying to market this now, they will, they will have a caveat that, well, it only applies to white women. 
without further increased disparity. So that's why for us, wisdom study, we're actually uh, charged with developing a PRS core that will be for women of African ancestry. My colleagues in UCSF are developing one for women uh, uh, of um, uh, 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 European admixed ancestry uh, using database from Latinx populations and trying to see how much of the uh, uh, the PRS that we have for white women actually works in uh, uh, in Latinos. But you also know that Latinos are a heterogeneous group. Puerto Ricans, uh, you know, people in from different Caribbean islands have different uh, genetic admixtures. So that's why uh, I've really been really gone ho on trying to do have a global perspective on cancer research. So we're not hoping that one size fits all, but that we can galvanize a global community to begin to ask these questions. Great, well, thank you so much, Dr. Olapade, for your time. And uh, if you wanna follow up, you are free to email Dr. Olapade questions. I'm sure she'd be happy to continue the conversation. Oh, it looks like somebody's giving you an applause sign. Okay. And uh, thank you. And one of the things, so for those of you who are uh, uh, going to be here because you can't travel, if you're looking to help us in terms of really disseminate some, disseminating some of this information as part of your community groups or community outreach, we're really hoping to deploy a lot of uh, resources to wisdom uh, so that we can really get a lot more women in Chicago to take the tool and then learn from uh, recruiting you know, a hundred thousand women in the wisdom study. Okay. All right, great, thank you.